you for being here this morning. We're uh, looking at uh, Acts chapter 4 again, uh, still, continually, always. Um, so sorry, it's uh, so slow for me to uh, walk my way through the material. And I'm anxious to uh, take you on this journey with me today. Uh, we're dealing with the sovereignty of God, of course, and have been. And we're continuing with that today and dealing especially with the subject of free will as it applies in the passage. So we're looking at Acts chapter 4, and I want to read with you again uh, the passage, although we've read it Sunday after Sunday, but it needs to be uh, in our mind again afresh and anew. So Acts chapter 4, verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. You made heaven and earth and the sea and all that are in them and all that are in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things, and the kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Reading verse 27 again. For truly your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Uh, we're coming to you today, Jesus, asking for clarity, uh, asking for knowledge, but not data, not not that stuff, but not just facts, not just philosophy, but to have a revelation of yourself, of truth that would come from your word that would give us such stability in the realm of the sovereignty of God in our lives that we, we, we would be able to relax in your presence, live in the flow of your spirit, and live dangerously because you are alive within us. Could we come today, God, and risk everything because it's safe to do so? Could we lavishly, abundantly, recklessly spill our lives out because it's just safe to do it? It's all okay because you are in charge and you have called us. So we give ourselves to you today and ask that you would speak to us out of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, the sovereignty of God is a uh, controversial subject. It's not controversial because do we believe in the sovereignty of God? Do we not? Everybody believes in the sovereignty of God. You can't go any place in the evangelical world, in the theological world of our day, that we don't all adhere to the dynamic of the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. But you understand that's all connected with who God is. Because if God isn't sovereign, then God isn't God, and whatever is above him must be sovereign, so God is sovereign. So any way you go, you have to have a sovereign God. God is sovereign. So everybody adheres to that. What divides us in the evangelical world, in the theological world, what divides us is how does that apply to my life? If God is sovereign, what does that mean for my everyday decisions? Do I have a choice when it comes right down to it? Is there, uh, is there am I just some kind, of, uh, some kind of prisoner trapped by the gigantic hands of God and he dictates and I, hey, it's all settled anyway, so what difference does it make? Is that what I'm dealing with? Am I just a puppet on the string that he is just pulling those strings and manipulating me? Is that what I am? And if so, then really, what we used to call fate is really who God is because whatever will be, will be, and that's the way it is. 
So the division in the sovereignty of God comes in the realm of how does that apply to my personal life, in the realm of choice and decisions and where I am. You understand that you can go to one extreme to the other in this. And whatever you want to believe about the sovereignty of God and how it applies to your life, you can find the answer you want for that in our world. And you can go to that church. Because it's all out there, folks. It's all out there. But what I'm interested in is what the Bible has to say. And you realize you can go from one extreme to the other. One extreme, of course, is that, hey, you are all predestined. You have no choice in any matter at all, and especially in the realm of salvation. You're going to be saved. You're not going to be saved. You have nothing to do with it. God is sovereign, and he has already decided your eternal destiny and fate. In fact, you are already determined in everything you are doing, so just relax and flow with it. You can go from that extreme, you can go to the extreme that God is sovereign and he really isn't interested in you at all. He's just wiped his hands of you, gone off and said, hey, forget that. And he, though he is sovereign, has no involvement in what's going on in your life. So you are up against all your, uh, all the affairs, all the involvement, all the intervention, all the coming of the circumstances of your life are all under your control and you're just going to have to do the best you can. So you've got two extremes and everything in between. And again, whatever you want to choose in, as an answer to that, you can find a church and go there. What I'm interested in is what the Bible has to say. I'm really not interested in your opinion as you are not interested in my opinion. I understand that. But I'm really interested in what on earth does the Bible has to say and, it, I, and, it, and, and I want the Bible to make it clear to me. I don't want interpretation. I don't want, well, that's the way you see it. This is the way I see it kind of stuff. What I want is, A, the Bible is clear on what the answer is and the involvement of the sovereignty of God in my personal life. I'm interested in that. It's really interesting that when you come to the subject of predestination, you will find that there are a few verses that deal with that subject. It is not a subject that is in every page. It is in six places only. Now, we believe in saturation around here, which means we take the scriptures and we go after it and crawl underneath it and allow it crawl into us and massage our lives and our minds until the truth becomes known to us. Now, if you want to take six verses and you want to base your entire decision and theology on six verses, you can do that. <gasps> right there it says it. Okay. But what do those six verses, how are those six verses impacted by the context of the entirety of the Scripture? That becomes important. Maybe they're not saying what you say they're saying when you read just that one verse. What happens when you take the entire scripture and squeeze it into those verses and you get the tone of what is really being taught to us? That's called saturation, people. And you've got to do that in the scriptures or you will really get off base. So that really becomes important in the whole investigation. One of the places where the word predestination, which, by the way, is the Greek word parizo, one of the places it's used is in relationship to, this, to the wisdom of God. God preordained, and the translation there is ordained his wisdom. One of the places that the word predestination is used is right here in our passage. It's uh, parizo, which is the word determined before. Predestined, God predestined this. Determined before. Four other places it's used, it's translated in my translation, predest predestined. So dealing with that becomes really, really important as you get into the passage. As you look at the word predestined and discover that God has predestined us, it becomes really important as you relate that to sovereignty of God. If God is sovereign, does he have a right to predestine? And if he has predestined and we are in a condition where 
everything is determined by him and we have no choice, do you realize what kind of problems arise out of that? God is sovereign. I have no choice. Therefore, my life is predetermined by him. Great, overwhelming problems arise out of that concept. So great that you end up concluding that is not the biblical approach. For instance, one of the problems you come out of with that, with that is, well, Adam had no choice then. He's in a garden where God gave him, you have, there's a tree you are not to eat of, and yet he really had no choice because God predestined him to sin. So God becomes the author of sin. So where did God, where did sin come from? God created sin by predestining Adam to sin. And then God came along with this phenomenal plan of redemption which involves overwhelming suffering on the part of God and on the part of his body which God also predestined. So God predestined the mess and predestined the answer to the mess. So any intelligence God would have stopped the whole thing before he predestined the, the mess. Those are the kind of problems you wrestle with in the sovereignty of God and how it applies to our personal life. It's interesting that the six places where the predestination, predestined, that idea shows up in the scriptures is in five of them, one of them is the wisdom of God, but in the other five, it deals with people and events. Track with me on this, because this really matters. When you look at these six passages, what you discover, especially the five, is that God never, ever, ever predestined an individual. It is always groups or categories. Let me say it again. When you look at where the scripture refers to predestined, God determining, it never is ever for an individual. An individual is never ever referred to in any of those passages. It's always groups or categories. Let me give you an example. For instance, Ephesians 1.5. Oh, Ephesians is such a phenomenal place. Paul just gets rolling on this thing, and he says, having predestined, there's our word, having predestined us, God is sovereign, can he not do that? Yes. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. God predestined us to be sons. Well, is your name there? No. Is my name there? No. Well, who, is, who has been predestined? Well, when you look at the context all through that chapter, it's those who are in him, in him, in him. He says it a half a dozen times. In him, God has taken those who are predestined, God has taken those who are in him, and he's predestined them. Who's predestined? Those that are in him. In fact, he goes on in that same passage, he says, oh, all these spiritual blessings are yours. To who? The guys that are in him. Uh, guess what? You are chosen. He's chosen us. Well, who are the people who are chosen? The ones that are in him. Oh, did you know that you are going to be holy and without blame? Well, who is? The ones who are in him. He goes on even to say, you want an inheritance? Hey, I'll tell you who's going to get the inheritance. The ones who are in him. Well, who's this in him group? That's a group. That's a category. Do I have a choice of whether to be in him or not? I do. I do. I do. But the Bible says I'm predestined. If you're in him, 
Don't show up in him, in, in him and see what happens to you. For instance, look at Romans 8, 29. This one's a little harder. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And, 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 and them he justified, he also glorified. Predestined. I'm predestined to be conformed. Who's predestined? The ones he foreknew. Interesting that the Greek word for foreknew there is the strongest word we have, which we use all the time around here, gnosko, which is the intimacy term. And it has a prefix on it. So we became intimate with him before we were conformed. So who's going to be conformed to his image? The ones that are intimate with him. And that has to take place before you can be conformed So is it you? Could be. Is it not you? Could be. It's interesting that every passage, folks, it, where the idea of predestined is used, it's never, are you getting this? It's never an individual. It's always a group or a category. That God predestined this group. What group? The group that's in him. The group that knows him. And when you get in that group, all of this is yours. You are predestined for that. God determined that his people should be like this. But you have a choice on whether to be his people. That's the whole point. Interesting. Now, come to our passage. It says, verse 27, For truly against your holy servant whom you anointed, Herod, Pontius Pilate. Uh oh we got names now. You said there were no names. We got two, Herod and Pontius Pilate. Oh. But you understand, come on, think. You understand this was written after the fact. Crucifixion took place. The book of Acts, written by Luke, after all of this. They looked back and said, oh, we know who was predestined. And name names. Herod, Pontius Pilate representing all the kings of the earth with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Who gathered them together? The impact is that God gathered them together. And he predestined them to do what? To do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. And we've talked about this. So what's the verse saying? Here is a group of people who've been predestined. The Israelites were predestined to crucify Christ. But wait a minute. There were some Israelites who didn't do that. There were 11 disciples that didn't get in on that. There was a Nicodemus that didn't get in on that. There was a Joseph. Oh, so it wasn't just all Israel. It was this group. Well, there was all these Gentiles. They got in on that. Yeah, but it wasn't all the Gentiles. There was choice within the Gentiles. There was a guy by the name of Cornelius that didn't get in on that. So what is he saying? He's saying God gathered together all of this group that was full of themselves and this group was predestined to do this. Which again is group, category. Now, supposing that you didn't get any of that, understand anything I've just said, we're going to back up and walk through it all again. And we're going to approach it from a little different way with some handles. We're going to start with the idea of the problem. See, with the sovereignty of God, you've got this problem. See, God has to be sovereign, people, or he's not God. One of the things that you and I cannot, cannot tolerate, absolutely cannot tolerate, is a weak, insufficient God who can't handle the scene. We can't tolerate that. It's the old contest thing. It's the Elijah deal and the Mount Carmel stuff. 
It's the idea, well, hey, come on, get in here. Let's have a contest. Let the real God, the God who really is in charge, the God who really can pull it off, the, re- the God who can really get things done, let him answer by fire. You make your prayers for a half a day. I'll make my five-second prayer, and we'll just see who's on top here. And we can't tolerate a God who can't answer by fire. And if God is not able, if God is not adequate, if God, well, he can handle most, but not that scene. We're, hey, we can't not tolerate that. We, we, hey, the Santa Claus thing, I quit believing in that because he couldn't handle my, well, never mind. The tooth fairy quit delivering because we can't stand that kind of God. So God absolutely has to be sovereign. But you understand that I've been taught all my life, probably you too, that absolute power brings absolute corruption. So if you've got an absolute God on your hands, an absolute sovereign God on your hands, then all these questions begin to arise. God, why? Why do the best people suffer? Why do the best people, the most spiritual people I know, get cancer? Why do I do everything I thought God wanted me to do and it just crumbled? It all went in reverse. Why, God? Why? If you're really, really in charge. And some of us have answered that by saying, well, God doesn't cause everything. He allows it, which, come on, all you've done is backed up a mile and you got to face the same thing. Because God didn't cause it, you think he's not responsible? Well, if he allowed it, he was responsible because he could have stopped it. So he could have prevented my car wreck. He could have prevented my cancer. He could have prevented my, he could have, he could have, he could have, but he didn't, so he has a responsibility in it because he's a sovereign God. So all of a sudden, we got all of these things coming at us saying, whoa, what about this sovereignty? In fact, isn't it interesting that God will allow me to come right up to him and shake my face fist in his face in aggressive rebellion against him and he doesn't smash me. If I were a sovereign God, trust me, you'd be smashed. Which is why they asked the question in the Psalms, which they quoted in verse 25. Why do the nations rage? The people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand. Can you believe it? The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So the sovereignty of God presents us with this amazing picture. Come on, God. Are you in or out? Are you or aren't you? Get with the program. What's the deal? Now, there's a, really the answer to that is not complicated. Let's talk about the provision. God granted free will. Well, that can't be because he's not sovereign. I don't think so. God granted free will and limited his sovereignty in your life. Which is not a sign that he's not sovereign. It's a sign that he's more sovereign than I pictured Because when you can limit your sovereignty, are you not more in control of the sovereignty? Who's who's more sovereign? The guy who's dominated by his sovereignty and absolutely has to have his own way? Or the guy who controls the sovereignty? 
his power and resource to allow free will. So I propose to you, God is absolutely sovereign because he is so sovereign, he can limit his sovereignty in your life and he has granted to you this overwhelming free will. I think that's phenomenal. You have a choice. Now, God is sovereign in his wisdom, absolutely, which means he knows, understands the depth of everything. So this sovereign God who limited his sovereignty in your life and said, I'm going to give you a choice, you know what, what that created? He understood it all. You know what that brought about? He understood. You know what the possibilities are on that one? Oh, he knew the depth of that thing. He didn't know, well, I hope this works out all right kind of stuff. He knew exactly where that was going, how deep it would take us, and where it would end up taking him in the redemption of a world. So God, in his overwhelming wisdom, understood all the depth and the play out of this whole thing, and yet took his sovereignty and limited it in your life now again, if I were a sovereign God and I understood the depth of where my sovereign, limiting my sovereignty in your life was going to take me, would I have done it? And if you look at a sovereign God in his wisdom and say, that wasn't too smart, let me remind you, you did the same thing. You brought birth to this little child. Do you know what you opened yourself up to? That kid is going to break your heart, step on your face. and contain within what you have brought about is the amazingness of overwhelming pain but also the potential and possibility of overwhelming love did God understand that yes he did he understood that he understood that by limiting his sovereignty, he was going to give you choice. And you know what the choice was? Who is going to be sovereign? Oh, you got to get this. See, the choice that he gave you was who's going to be sovereign. Whether he's going to be sovereign in your life because he's a sovereign God or whether you are going to be sovereign in your life which is self-sovereignty. And that became the choice. There is no other choice. The choice is not about alcohol. The choice is not about drugs. The choice is not about hate. The choice is not about murder. The choice is not about adultery. The choice is not about pornography. The choice is not about anything but sovereignty of God or self-sovereignty. See, I'm not really interested in being self-sovereign as God is sovereign. I'm not really interested in that. See, I don't really want to be God. God may going to be God. I mean, I don't have time to take care of Mars and Jupiter and gravity and all that stuff. <laughs> you know, go to it, God. Have a big time. But, hey, I'm drawing a circle around this boy, and right here in my world, in my life, I am declaring... And it doesn't end up being that. It ends up being, I'm declaring sovereignty here. And you understand, ladies and gentlemen, that every sin in our lives revolves around that You understand that every sin in our lives spills out of that, has its rootage in that, which is over against his sovereignty. 
So the overwhelming battle that's going on is a battle between the sovereignty of God. Will I let him be sovereign in my life? Or will I be sovereign in my life? And you understand self-sovereignty is an illusion. Because you are not in charge at all. <laughs> there are so many variables in your life that are out of your control that you just are buffeted from one end to the other in your life experience because you can't, and you're just scrambling to just properly react to everything that's out of control in your life. Because sovereignty is a joke. So here we are. Can you imagine us? We're running around the countryside as if we're in charge when we're in charge of nothing. We're totally incapable. We're acting like we're God in our lives when we were never intended to be God at all. We were intended to come under the sovereignty of his greatness. So what have we said so far? We've said there's this overwhelming problem with the sovereignty of God because absolute power creates absolute corruption. So if God is absolutely sovereign, oh my, but God took his absolute sovereignty and limited it and gave me free will, which gave me the possibility of saying absolutely no, and I can become self-sovereign. I'll run my show. I'll do my own thing. I'll operate. Well, let me know how that works out for you. I'll do my own thing. I'll operate my own life. I'll make my own decisions over against the sovereignty of his greatness but if absolute power produces absolute corruption and God is absolutely sovereign you're going to have to prove to me that it can work out in my life and what is the proof ladies and gentlemen the proof that it works out in your life is Jesus That God is love. And that that is a distinct, absolute, isn't this so simple? That is a distinct, absolute reality. That God is absolute love. He is not love, love, like, ooh, tickles up and down my spine, love. He's not romantic love. He's not sentimentality love. He's not, oh, I like you because I need love. He is absolute, pure, selfless, self-giving, self-sacrificing kind of love. It's called agape in the Bible. And God is just absolutely, always, consistently all the time pouring his life out for you never ever thinking about himself but always out for you and if that's his absolute power but that's not his absolute power because God is absolutely powerful absolutely sovereign but love is more powerful than God because love has literally brought God under control and brought his sovereignty under control so love is God only not sentimental love love is God only God is a person and his name is God and he's absolutely sovereign in his love and he cannot do anything in your life but love you it is impossible the nature of who he is for him to do anything to you or anything in you that isn't pure absolute sovereign love pouring his life out consistently, constantly, always for you. You can trust him. Back to our passage. The passage. What is it all about? Here's this group of people involved in him because we're after the fact. We know there was a guy by the name of Herod involved in them because we're, it's after the fact. We know there was a guy by the name of Pontius Pilate. Herod represents all the kings. Pontius Pilate represents all the rulers. The Gentiles all got, were all involved in it. The Gentile world was involved in it. The people of Israel were involved into it. And what happened? God reached out and gathered this whole group together. Again, there were all kinds of Gentiles that weren't involved. And there were all kinds of Israelites that weren't involved. So it's not 
just the sovereign God picking people out. It's a group that he knew and elevated God in his sovereignty, gathered them together and elevated them to a position of authority and said, hey, do exactly what your self-sovereignty determines you should do. Come on. Do exactly what your self-sovereignty, what your self-rulership, what I'm going to do what I want to do. Do exactly what that wants you to do. And what they did exactly that. They crucified Jesus because self-sovereignty can't stand the sovereign love of God. It is so irritating. See, when I hit you and you love me, I hate it. I want you to hit me back. Right? See, when I'm nasty to you, what do I want? I want you to be nasty to me. And when you are nasty to me, it irritates me. I hate that. So here was a whole group of people that God elevated and said, hey, help yourself. Do exactly what yourself. Could they tolerate Jesus? No. Could they stand him? No. Could they put up with him? Absolutely not. Well, what are they going to do to Jesus? They're going to nail him, man. And God put them in the position where they would do exactly what God wanted them to do because in the nailing of Jesus, redemption took place. Do you see that? When I come under his sovereignty instead of my self-sovereignty, you know what he does? He elevates me to positions in my world that allows the world to do what it will do, which sets up a platform for redemption in my world. Folks, you talk about ministry, it's not here. You talk about ministry, it's out there. When the world comes at me and I find myself being Jesus in that scene and they nail me and when they do that, blood gets all over them. And redemption takes place. And that's where ministry happens. Out there. And that's what he's calling us to. So this morning, you and I are into the overwhelming decision. God's sovereignty in my life. Self-sovereignty. You can trust him. You can't trust yourself. You can trust him. That's been proven millions of times. You can't trust yourself. That's been proven to you. Jesus. It isn't that I'm not religious, God. I am. It isn't that I don't go to church. I do. It isn't that I'm not interested in helping the community. I am. It isn't that I don't want to feed the homeless. I do. The problem is, God, I am so self-sovereign in my life activity and thought process and I don't mind having you help me now and then <laughs> you're a benefit to have around and I use you like I use the bank like I use all the other people around me 
and you're good, you're good to have in a bad spot. But it's my will, my desire, what I... God, I'm so stuck on myself. And could it be that what you're trying to get through to us about is the very essence of our own self-sovereignty which seems to consistently get in our way? And redemption doesn't take place in our families and redemption doesn't take place in our community because we are never quite into you dominating our lives, spilling your love into our world, and we are experiencing the flow of who you are. So call us today, God, in tenderness and love again Call us, because there is a group. You've predestined them. You've ordained them. You have set them aside. I could be in that group today, the group that's redemptive, the group that pours their life out, the group that is, that is found, chosen, the group that has the phenomenal inheritance, the group that is holy and without blame, the group, oh, I could step into that group. I have a choice today. I could step into that group. I could be a part of the group that is the redemptive force of the world. But I can't be self-sovereign and do it. Break me of myself. Smash me, God. Tear down my walls that has to have its own way. Tear down the protective coating that I've put in my life that won't risk. Oh, sovereign. who's limited his sovereignty to give me choice. Heads are bowed. The issue is not alcohol. The issue is not drugs. The issue is not pornography. The issue is not adultery. The issue is not murder. The issue is not meanness. The issue is not hatred. The issue is Jesus is Lord. The only safe place is under the canopy of that Lordship. You can be on your own if you want to. But the ironic thing is when you're on your own, and crying out to God to intervene, and you're asking, well, God, why? If you're sovereign, why? You wouldn't ask that question if he was sovereign in your life. That question is a result of self-sovereignty. Because we want to do our own thing and then have him protect us and bail us out and pull it off.
But you rejected Santa Claus over that one and the tooth fairy. And in a feeble way today, while we're bowed in prayer, I offer you, ladies and gentlemen, a God who is sovereign. And His love has so overtaken His sovereignty that He is safe. Would you run into His arms today? Would you totally be His today? Moments of seeking. Our altar's open.